Good evening from Washington. I'm Larry O'Connor. Uh, we haven't said too much about Robert F. Kennedy Jr. here on this program, other than we don't want him anywhere near the White House as president of the United States because, well, he's a pretty liberal left-wing Democrat, and he's got some pretty radical environmental views. That said, we do love the fact that Biden is terrified of him. The whole apparatus of the Democrat Party is trying to do whatever they can to silence him, censor him, and squash him so that his voice can't be heard. That's why we took special notice of an appearance he made last night on the News Nation cable network. He was doing a uh, town hall, and he said something. We're going to take some time looking at it. That really does shine a light on where the Democrats have gone since his dad was the almost Republican nominee for president back in 1968, and why Joe Biden is terrified to have this man's voice heard. Here, take a look. You say that you're a Democrat, um, but you're getting a lot of support from the, a lot of leading voices on the right, like Steve Bannon, Tucker Carlson, Alex Jones, former President Donald Trump. Many Democrats fear that you're a spoiler in the race, that you will damage President Biden in the primary and grease the skids for former President Trump to return to the Oval Office. This week, former President Trump said about you, Kennedy is smart and he's a common sense guy. What kind of man do you think Donald Trump is? All right, let's pause there for a moment. First of all, she's absolutely right. That's why the Democrats are scared of him because they think he does do damage to Joe Biden. In fact, he already has done damage to Joe Biden. You know, in the latest polls, Joe Biden is currently at about 66 percent amongst Democrats for the nomination. He's the incumbent president. He's running against two people, Kennedy and Marianne Williamson, who have never held elected office before. There's been no debates and he's only getting two thirds of the Democrats to support him for the nomination. That's a real problem. Kennedy, on the other hand, he's getting about 20 percent already. Uh, but did you see what the reporter did here? You're supposed to be interviewing a candidate about what they stand for, what they would do if they were to be elected president. And the question is, tell us what you think of Donald Trump. This is part of the problem with the media. This is why you're looking for alternatives to this mindset that you see in Washington, D.C. right now, where everything is about your reaction to Donald Trump. Well, Kennedy did a terrific job with this question. Let's watch what he says, and, and, and we'll watch it together, because there are certain moments here that are incredibly important for all of us to reflect on. Go ahead. No, here's what I'm not going to do in this race. I'm not going to ta attack other people per personally. I don't think it's good for our country. And I think, you know, what I'm trying to do in this race is bring people together, is to try to bridge the divide between Americans. And guess what? The... It's, you know, let's, when my dad let's died. Pause here for a quick second, because this is critical. He's using the same language that Joe Biden used four years ago when he said, I want to bring this country together again. We've been too divided. Vote for me and I'll bring people together. What kind of job did he did bringing us together? I want to bring people together. But anytime I have a chance, I'm going to call half of this country who voted for my opponent right wing radical fascists who are racist and support Jim Crow laws if they want to ask for an ID when you go to vote. He's illuminating right now by using Biden's language exactly what a liar Joe Biden was and how divisive he has been. All right, let's continue. And we took this train ride from, you know, this seven and a half hour train ride that was supposed to be two hours. I brought his, I was with him when he died in Los Angeles. And then we brought his body from, uh, from New York, Penn Station to Union Station and Washington, D.C. And there were, there were, it was a two and a half hour ride, but it took seven and a half hours because there were two and a half million people on that train track. And, and it was the cross section of America and all of the major urban stations in Trenton, Newark, uh, uh, Wilmington and Baltimore. There were black Americans singing Battle Hymn of the Republic. There were whites on the, in the rural areas who, love, who were holding up signs, goodbye Bobby, pray for us Bobby, American flag standing, saluting. Four years later, and they had supported my father in the primaries in 1968. Four years later, in 1972, they were not supporting my father, and they were not support. They were not supporting George McGovern, who was aligned with my father on all these issues. Instead, the vast majority of them were supporting George Wallace. And you know, there, my father was able to harness these populist energies. In the last day of his life, he won the most rural state in this country, South Dakota, and the most urban. 
he was able to bridge the divide among people who would otherwise be Republican, but wanted somebody who was common sense, who was able to appeal to their idealism, who was able to find the hero in each of them, who was able to get them to transcend narrow self-interest and see themselves as part of a community and part of this you know, incredible American adventure uh, in, in modeling self-governance for the rest of the world. And so I'm proud that President Trump likes me, even though I don't agree with him on most of his issues. I'm, because I don't want to alienate people. I want to bring people together. I'm proud that all these people like me and that I have independent supporters and Democratic supporters and that I'm able to bring a lot of people. You know, every Democrat says, I want to end the polarization. But how do you do that without talking to people who don't agree with you? How do you do that without appealing to people? Without the per My purpose is to find the issues, the values that we have in common, rather than, you know, focus on the issues and the personalities that keep us all apart. Let me tell you something. That message right there, whether delivered by a Democrat or a Republican, is exactly what the vast majority of Americans are waiting to hear. And they're also waiting to actually see it put in practice. You've got a Democrat right there saying, I'm proud that Donald Trump likes me, even though I disagree with him. I'm proud to have support from people who also support Donald Trump. That's actually what it looks like to be a unifier. And I know that he's running as a Democrat. And again, I don't want him to be president, but there's something incredibly appealing, not just about that message, but the way Robert Kennedy delivers the message. And I'm sure you think that this is a real lesson for the Democrats and take that, Joe Biden. But before you go too far down that road, this is a very important lesson for the Republicans in this race, and most specifically Donald Trump. If Donald Trump were asked the same question, what kind of man do you think Joe Biden is? Would he have answered this same way? If Donald Trump was asked, how can we unify this country considering how divided we are? Would Donald Trump have answered the same way? I think that the people who support Joe Biden and the people who support Donald Trump are missing something very important about presidential politics. I would love to live in a world where everybody votes for someone based on policy and plans for what they're going to do when they get into office and party platforms. But the fact of the matter is, a lot of voters in this country vote for the person, not the policies. And the people who are supporting Donald Trump, and most importantly, the people in Donald Trump's camp, they need to recognize that there are a lot of people in this country who just don't like him. And he's got to spend some time actually maybe learning a lesson from Kennedy here and recognizing that the language he uses and the way he presents himself, not just his ideas, are just as important in getting votes. The fact is, both parties could learn something from Mr. Kennedy after this exchange. Uh, one other thing, a lot of people say that Kennedy is dangerous because of his vaccine positions, and I get that. We're purposely not really talking about it. But I will say this, I'm sure you noticed that his voice is very distinctive. It sounds damaged. It's hard to listen to sometimes. A lot of people wonder, why is that? What's wrong with his voice? Well, he was injured by a flu vaccine years and years and years ago. It's one of the reasons why he's so passionate about that issue. You should keep that in mind. There's more to come on O'Connor tonight. Earlier today, we had a historic decision from the Supreme Court of the United States uh, striking down and dismantling affirmative action in higher education. But does it go further than that? Let's bring in the senior legal fellow at Heritage Foundation, Giancarlo Canaparo. All right. Well, first, let's start with the decision itself. What exactly did SCOTUS tell us today? Sure. So today, the Supreme Court said that universities uh, cannot racially balance their student bodies the way they have been doing for so many years. Uh, they grounded their decision in the Equal Protection Clause, which stands for uh, the absolute equality of all people before the laws. So uh, universities will not be able to racially balance their student bodies. They will not be able to rely on racial stereotypes to give demerits and uh, benefits to certain students. Uh, that uh, age, at least as a matter of, of, of the law, is over. 
And this applied to, there were two decisions here um, having to do with Harvard, which is uh, at least nominally a private university and University of North Carolina, public university. And the decision was uh, the same for both institutions? That's correct. Uh, neither institutions are now permit permitted to use race uh, to balance their student bodies. Now, the Supreme Court said that uh, you may consider uh, in an application, an individual's application and on an individual basis, whether, say, suffering racial discrimination has cultivated in a particular applicant the benefits or the virtues of resilience and uh, overcoming hardship. But you can't just use race to balance your student bodies, and you can't use stereotypes about races to uh, claim some benefit of diversity. Uh, right. Now, individuals must be treated as individuals. And not as I just want to groups. drill down on this thing, because when you say use stereotypes about races, so in other words, I mean, one of the ways that uh, this uh, affirmative action and various racial decisions with regard to admittance into universities has been made is that if you are white, the presumption is that you have benefited from the color of your skin at some point, either in your actual life or your parents, grandparents, generationally. Even if you're poor and coming from Appalachia, uh, you're white, so therefore you had privilege. Is that the kind of stereotype they're talking about? That's one of them. In fact, what Harvard did was even worse. Uh, Harvard looked at Asian students and realized that because Asian students tend to do very well academically, uh, they would be what, what Harvard called overrepresented at Harvard. So what Harvard did <laughs> is said on a systematic basis that Asians lack leadership skills, they lack charisma, they lack uh, diligence and they lack other interpersonal skills. Uh, Hold on. So that Harvard they said that. Harvard yes, said that. Yeah, that's how Harvard uh, reduced the amount of Asians Boy, that otherwise would be admitted. One by racist Asians. college up there in Boston. Right, and that is, you know, that is one of the great problems underlying affirmative action programs is that they are deep down racist. There's no such thing as benign discrimination. Uh, discriminating on the basis of race is just plain bad. All right. Now, um, this mentality has permeated to some public high schools, secondary uh, education in America as well, government run schools like right here in the D.C. area. Famously, this is a national story. Thomas Jefferson High School. They started using racial quotas it's all under the guise of equity, right? Equity, diversity, equity and inclusion. But it absolutely was punishing Asian-American students for succeeding so well. Again, they use that term that you just used over representation. Will this decision apply to government-run secondary institutions, elementary schools, all the public schools? Well, secondary in institutions, to the extent that they've been using race at all, are already in a gray zone. Because even before the Supreme Court said that universities could do this, it has never said that lower schools could do this. Uh, well, now, for sure, lower schools may not do what Harvard and okay. UNC are now prohibited from doing. Now, uh, with regard to the decision uh, at Harvard, a private institution, even though they do get government funding, and it is, as, like, as I said, nominally a private institution, does that mean that an affirmative action program at any private organization, even a private business, is that now considered verboten? Well, actually, that has already and always been uh, prohibited. Universities have been gra granted uh, an exception from the usual civil rights laws over history, which was because uh, to advance what they called diversity. Now, for them, of course, that's just visual diversity. It's not sort of a genuine diversity of thought. Uh, but universities has, have always existed in an exception. Now, what the Supreme Court has said essentially is that they don't get the exception. But employers have never been allowed to discriminate on the basis of race. Uh, for diversity or anything like that. Now, many of them do anyway, and I think that they think that the risk of getting sued is just sort of a cost of uh, virtue signaling. Uh, but um, maybe this decision, if it has any effect on employers, will be to embolden people to sue their employers when they uh, discriminate on the basis of race. And uh, I'm sure the same applies in government. But as you said, uh, theoretically, this has been off limits, but it hasn't been. We see it in practice all the time for crying out loud. The President of the United States, when he was choosing a running mate, said, I don't know who it's going to be, but I know it's going to be a black woman. I mean, isn't that discrimination? Right, it is. And what this shows us is that that desire to discriminate ostensibly for good or benign purposes is really 
something of a religion among the left at the moment, and they're not going to give it up. They're going to keep fighting it. Uh, so, you know, this this Supreme Court case is only the beginning. It is not by any means uh, the end of the fight for absolute equality. Reading from Justice Thomas's uh, uh, decision here, his concurrent decision, he said, and I'm quoting him, those policies fly in the face of our colorblind constitution and our nation's equality ideal. In short, they are plainly and boldly unconstitutional. You know, these days, if you say we want a colorblind society, we want, as I quoted at the beginning of this segment, Martin Luther King's dream to be judged by our character and our principles and our values and who we are, not on the color of our skin, that's considered racist today based on the Ibram X. Kendi definition of racism. Is, is Have we turned the corner on that? Have we put that in the rearview mirror now? Uh, well, as far as the Supreme Court is concerned, yes. As far as a significant segment of the population is concerned, no. I mean, what Martin Luther King Jr. said at the time was a radical proposition. Now, uh, that is a conservative proposition. Uh, and it is still, as much as it were, was then, it is still today worth fighting for. All right. So what could happen here? I've seen some people commenting, saying, you know, don't don't underestimate the left's ability to push their agenda and and push this law as far as they want. In other words, first, might we see some states basically ignore this and say, screw it, we're going to do what we want. Let's see. Uh, let, let the chips fall where they may. Or will they just throw out all standards and make it? I, I hear this all the time. I've just Two kids just went to God. I got my third kid in college. They all say the same thing. We use a holistic approach to admissions. It's not SATs anymore. Stanford doesn't even look at SATs anymore. Uh, it's not about GPA. It's a holistic approach. And when it's holistic, you don't really define what it is. And so they're going to do it without actually saying they're doing it. That is the, ne the next big trouble uh, or challenge will be proving that university are universities are still doing it. Many still will. They will find other ways to do it. Now, they may not, uh, like Harvard did, they're not going to discriminate against Asians systematically. What they'll do instead now is give advantages to zip codes and high schools where they know that uh, a high proportion of the races they like can be found, and they'll give disadvantages to zip codes and high schools where the races they don't like can be found. Uh, that's what they're going to do. They're, and, and to some extent, they will probably um, uh, de-systematize some of their admissions processes. So there will be a sort of conscious parallelism to giving races, certain races an advantage in admissions, but they won't say so explicitly. So the challenge will be uh, proving going forward that universities are still doing this. And I'm quite confident that many still will. So the next step is to continue to bring lawsuits when uh, we suspect that universities are doing this and to uh, for state legislators to uh, enact sunshine laws so that the public can see how their public universities uh, uh, operate and how their admissions processes work. Very quick exit question here, Giancarlo. I'm out of time, but it's an important question to ask. Had Hillary Clinton won the election in 2016 for president, would this decision have come through today? Oh, certainly not. We would be descending deep down the Kennedy rabbit hole. Discrimination would be the only way to cure historic discrimination. It would be a very dark day for racial equality. And Roe v. Wade would still be the law of the land one year sure. later. It's good to acknowledge that, too. Thanks for joining us. There's more to My come pleasure. on O'Connor tonight on a big news night. Keep it here. It's Salem News Channel. Have we mentioned the president of the United States is a teeny bit corrupt? And there's also, of course, a cover up going on. That's after the obstruction of justice. There is a whole lot of impeachment ahead of us. Yesterday, as we mentioned, President Biden was asked specifically by a reporter whether he was sitting next to his son when that whole shakedown for five million dollars took place. Here's the president's very reasonable and not at all defensive or guilty reaction. President Biden, how involved, President Biden, how involved were you in your son's Chinese shakedown text message? Were you sitting there? Were you involved? Were you No. Yikes. Okay, Gramps, take it easy. We're going to stop asking you about all those millions of dollars you got from China. And that's the point. 
regardless of whether he was sitting next to his son or not, just a few days later, yes, $5 million showed up in one of Hunter Biden's multiple shell corporations, and it came from the Chinese. So what did they buy for that money? Let's bring in Gordon Chang. You can follow him on Twitter at Gordon G. Chang, and he's the author of The Coming Collapse of China. I mean, Gordon, that's what this is really all about, isn't it? What were the Chinese buying with the Biden family? I think they were buying access, Larry. Um, we know from the academic Di Dongsheng, who gave that famous lecture in November of 2020, right after our general election, and he was talking about how the Chinese regime was looking forward to reestablishing its contacts with the Oval Office that had been broken during the Trump administration. And then Di said that the Chinese could determine outcomes at the highest levels of the Chinese political system. No American could resist what China wanted and that every American could be bought. And by the way, the biggest laugh that D got during this live stream uh, lecture was when he said two words, Hunter Biden. Wow. I mean, I, and you don't hear that in the media as they're uh, ignoring this story. But you would think that that would be rather relevant. And speaking of Hunter Biden, another WhatsApp text message to his handlers in China had been revealed. And this language is incredibly curious. He said, and I'm quoting now, the Bidens are the best I know at doing exactly what the chairman wants from this partnership. Uh, chairman is capitalized, by the way. And of course, I'm guessing that doesn't mean the chairman of some corporation. He's talking about Xi Jinping, isn't he? Indirectly, I'm, I'm sure he is, um, because remember that whether a company is private or state, civilian or military, they're all one in China because it's a communist totalitarian system these days. And that means that Xi Jinping can call up the head of CEFC or any Chinese company doing business with the Bidens and tell them what Biden should do. So clearly, Hunter Biden was saying, we're going to take our orders. Um, and he yeah. had to know the context of that. Gordon, yesterday in his speech in Chicago about Bidenomics, uh, President Biden sort of went off script. And he, he was bragging about the fact that he's met with Xi Jinping privately over 68 times, more than 68 hours. Nobody on the planet knows Xi Jinping better than he does. Um, and I don't know if that's necessarily the best testimony for him to give, considering what we're learning about his family's relationship with China. What message, when he says that during the context of a presidential address, how is that received in Beijing? Oh, I'm sure the Chinese are just laughing. You know, that they, <laughs> th there is this sense among Americans, not just Biden, that, you know, if we can only talk to them, that we can get them to see things our way. And unfortunately, when you look at the history of what's happened during the Biden administration, um, we have been um, doing things that have been making China more belligerent. So, for instance, after the spy balloon, the State Department, according to Reuters, um, postponed actions it had planned to take against China. And so China got a twofer. It got to surveil our nuclear weapons sites, but it also got the State Department to back down. And we think that this is going to sort of make China more um, amenable. But what it's really doing is giving the incentives to act even more provocatively. So, And that's what we have seen. We have seen turbulence during the Biden era that we did not see during the Trump years. Gordon, I remember very early on in the Biden administration, he immediately, the president did, he re reversed a policy during, during the Trump administration that uh, kept Chinese nationals and specifically people with links to the Chinese government to have presence on American college campuses. Biden reversed that almost immediately when he took office. What was that all about? Why was that a red flag for you? Well, you know, and it was not only that, it was just hours after taking the oath of office, um, Biden issued an executive order that reversed the Trump one the Trump order prohibited the importation into the United States of electrical grid equipment from China. So we saw, you know, a series of actions that Biden took, which were inexplicable. You know, one could say that every, of course, every president wants to review the China policy of his predecessor, but you need to keep protections in place. And we saw this throughout his Biden's actions of not protecting America. And this really is dangerous because I think it gave the Chinese the sense that they could do whatever they wanted. 
like that academic in Shanghai uh, was talking about. So I think the Chinese actually believe that they can get Biden pretty much to do what they want when they really want him to do something. By the way, this uh, all of this news that we're learning about the Biden family's connections and all of that money that was flowing in from China to the Biden family shell corporations, this comes just within days of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence revealing Friday without anyone noticing that, yeah, the research and an investigation into the origins of the COVID-19 virus that killed millions around the world does, in fact, lead directly to that lab in Wuhan. China's been lying to us from day one about it. They still haven't been transparent or allowed world health uh, officials to come and inspect that plant in any meaningful way. I mean, and Biden administration has pretty much said nothing about it. They want it to go away. They want to ignore the pandemic, Gordon, and, and China's hands are all over it. Yeah. Uh, in Biden's conversations with Xi Jinping, both in person and phone, he has never once raised the issues of the origins of COVID-19. Biden has had one in-person meeting and I think six or seven video calls or phone calls. Um, also, you know, Biden did sign the COVID Origins Act in March, um, but that was supposed to lead to the declassification of the underlying intelligence. And the director of national intelligence on Friday just issued a summary report. That doesn't meet the requirements of the statute. And so really what you've got to be concerned is that the Biden administration is trying to protect the Communist Party in something that has killed, according to Johns Hopkins, more than 1.1 million Americans and almost 7 million, America, 7 million people worldwide which I believe the 7 million figure is underestimated. Yeah. By the way, they missed the deadline that that law dictated in terms of releasing at least this preliminary report because they didn't want Anthony Blinken to have to deal with it when he was visiting Beijing. Again, cowardly stance against our adversaries over there in China. And one other thing, Gordon, when we talk about how the Biden administration's policies have changed, maybe as a direct result of all of those millions of dollars. You've recently written an article over at the Gatstone Institute with regard to what you're calling China's saboteurs who are crossing our border illegally down in Mexico. Tell me about this. Yeah, we are seeing packs of Chinese males of military age, unattached to family groups, pretending not to speak English, coming into our country. Um, Chairman Mark Green, uh, chair of the House uh, DHS, uh, Homeland Security uh, Committee, said that he actually talked to a border protection sector chief who said that some of these Chinese males have known affiliations to the People's Liberation Army. Um, there is other evidence that these are saboteurs coming into our country. Biden administration is releasing them into the United States and, as far as we know, is not tracking them. And really what we've got here is a big cadre of, the, of uh, saboteurs spread throughout the United States, probably linking up with sleeper agents and the Chinese consulate. Um, there is really disturbing evidence that these are not who they say they are. And one other thing, Larry, we are seeing a surge, an unprecedented surge of Chinese migrants into our country, indicating that China itself is in distress, which means that Xi Jinping, who we just talked about, he probably has incentives to rally the Chinese people with a war. And so we are at the doorstep of one, as Henry Kissinger said. Henry Kissinger said, war between China and the United States is, quote unquote, probable. Yeah, uh, you make a good point. If the Chinese economy is so strong and we're sending all of our things to be manufactured over there, why on earth would migrant workers from China have to make the around the world trek to come to Mexico to cross into our country? Gordon Chang, sobering stuff as always. Thank you for joining us. There's more to come on O'Connor Tonight. Pete Buttigieg is the Secretary of Transportation. Now, that might come as a surprise to you because most of his public utterances are about everything but trains, planes, and automobiles. He talks about racism. He talks about gay pride. He talks about how he adopted some babies. He talks about, oh, actually, it was a surrogate situation. Anyway, that's none of my business. I don't need to know about it. What I need to know is why my planes have been delayed and why I can't use a gas stove in my home. Well, Pete Buttigieg needs to answer for those issues because he is Secretary of Transportation. And our next guest is asking all the right questions. She's Caitlin Sutherland, Executive Director of Americans for Public Trust. And 
uh, you've uncovered some interesting information about uh, Pete Buttigieg and what might be motivating his move to make us all drive electric cars and cook on electric stoves. And it goes back to China. Right. So it seems like the Secretary of Transportation has been focusing on everything but transportation. And the latest records that we just received showed that he met with a China connected group working to ban gas stoves and electrify America. So again, this shows that his priorities are consistently out of touch with what Americans want him to focus on, which is reliable and safe transportation. Yeah, and uh, this group, it's called RMI. What, what, what interest do they have in meeting with the Secretary of Transportation in the first place? Yeah, R RMI or Rocky Mountain Institute has actually been slowly infiltrating the administration. We've previously found that they've met with Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm, and now we come to find out that the CEO is also meeting with Pete Buttigieg. Now, why is that important? Well, he's previously said that every transportation decision is also a climate decision. And if you take a look at their priorities, they are completely out of touch. Uh, and what's the link to China with Rocky Mountain? Well, they are funded uh, through a lot of CCP connected groups, and they also are working to implement what China would like. Also, they have extremist views when it comes to their energy policy. They want to ban fossil fuels. They would love it if everyone uh, could get rid of their gas cars and just completely electrify freight. Uh, and and this is one of those groups that says, you know, we want zero carbon emission transportation in the United States, which is a pipe dream. That's just that's impossible. And even if they did have such a pipe dream come to fruition in this country, not only would it cost trillions of dollars, but would it make any tangible difference in global climate temperatures? Well, again, let's also talk about as at the same time that Pete Buttigieg is meeting with this group that wants to ban fossil fuels. He is also jet setting around the country on a taxpayer funded jet. Oh, so I think yes, we also let's, not, need to... let's not forget that. Thank you. <laughs> let's not forget zero that. Carbon for thee, but not for me. Exactly. Uh, so whether or not their lofty goals are even attainable, which they're not, it is the height of hypocrisy that Pete Buttigieg would even make the time to meet with a radical green energy group at the time that he's crisscrossing and jet setting in America with a private jet that is spewing, uh, you know, so much, you know, wasteful gas. Yeah. Meanwhile, Caitlin, you know, uh, Southwest Airlines has had a tough couple of months with a bunch of flight cancellations. And I remember Biden and Buttigieg went out there and said, we're going to punish these airlines for delaying people. They, they should have to pay. United Airlines just had a horrible weekend with cancellations fourth straight day of thousands of cancellations across the country. They claim it's because of heavy rain. I've been around for a long time. I don't remember rainstorms causing this much of a problem. Yeah, I think that we have seen since Buttigieg has held the Department of Transportation that every sort of transportation has become so unreliable. We saw it last summer, again, when he was at the height of traveling on a private jet, we saw it during the holiday season, these airlines just in a complete meltdown. But again, what is Pete Buttigieg focusing on? Well, he's focusing on meeting with China connected groups that want to ban your gas stove. So again, yeah. instead of making sure that we have easy travel, particularly around the holiday seasons, he is doing anything but. Yeah, going into this holiday weekend for July 4th, and there's a deadline here. Airlines are supposed to upgrade a bunch of their systems to 5G. They haven't. Theoretically, they're going to have a lot of cancellations again. Uh, but the FAA, who's in charge of administering all of this and overseeing all of this and, and punishing airlines if they don't step up, that's under Pete Buttigieg's control, right? All of that. He, he acts like this is all happening and he's just a witness to it. And he's just as outraged as anybody else. And he'll, he'll put out a tweet, Caitlin, that says, we're going to crack down on this. Well, what, if, what has he been doing? That's a great question. And I think everybody would like to know, uh, you know, the paper tiger tweets that he puts out on a daily basis are doing nothing to ensure that we have safe and efficient travel. And I think Americans are getting fed up about how unreliable transportation has become. Uh, 
in the long run, is the Transportation Department one of those departments where if you get a new person in there with a new president, they can easily turn this around? See, I worry sometimes, Caitlin, that they start implementing all of this green energy stuff. Every transportation decision is a climate decision. And no matter how good the next secretary is, it's almost impossible to turn the turn the ship around. You're absolutely right. When you have a bad and underperforming cabinet secretary like Pete Buttigieg, we really could see a problematic turnaround of these awful policies that we're seeing out of the Department of Transportation, like we are seeing out of his own FAA. But I think across the board in the Biden administration, we are seeing where their priorities are just so out of touch. Again, why are they focused on meeting with radical green energy groups instead of what he should be doing instead, which is fixing roads and bridges. Yeah, but I think the answer is this is where the money is, right? This is, I mean, these groups who benefit from all of these green transportation climate initiatives that are funded by the federal government, they, that money goes to groups like this, right? I mean, that's, it's, it's, it's the oldest story in American politics. Yeah. And let's not forget that we had to request his private calendar to even reveal this meeting. Why was he trying to hide his calendar? It was only obtained through a Freedom of Information Act request. This is not something that he is forward facing. And this is not the first time that we've caught him meeting with an extremist green energy group. Previous calendars has shown that he's meeting with NRDC and the League of Conservation Voters. These groups pump millions into liberal and left-leaning candidates' coffers. So yes, if you follow the money, you can see where their priorities are going to get implemented. Well, and listen, this guy has ambitions. Obviously, he ran for president last time around. He wants to be president again. He is a young man. And no one's going to elect a guy for getting planes running on time, trains running on time, and fixing potholes in the streets, as the Secretary of Transportation should be in charge of even though he couldn't fix the potholes when he was mayor of South Bend, Indiana. No, what's going to get you the nomination from the Democrats is if you're a leader in green energy and climate change. So they could have made him, you know, the secretary of Veterans Affairs and his priority would be climate change. That's absolutely right. And you know what? He can't have it both ways. He can't be a forward facing cabinet secretary and at the same time shun away any time individuals would like to criticize him. Any time that folks have said, why are you focusing on saying that roads are racist instead of where you should be, he gets very upset and very defensive and has to defend his tenure as Secretary of Transportation. So which way is it? Are you going to be the green energy leader or are you going to be the calm and collected Secretary of Transportation? Caitlin Sutherland, Americans for Public Trust, thanks for joining us. And uh, when you all are delayed this weekend, when you're trying to get where you want to go for 4th of July, Remember who's responsible. That'd be Mayor Pete. There's more to come on O'Connor tonight. Leave it to Dana Carvey and David Spade, two alums from Saturday Night Live, to make comedy funny again. They've got a new podcast, and they teased out a little clip of them talking about COVID. And I want you to watch it and then reflect on why we aren't seeing this kind of humor anywhere else right now. Here, take a look. I miss COVID. I know. Dude, you know what I knew? There was trouble <laughs> when anyone that came to our country didn't have to get a vaccine. And I go, mm -hmm. if you're telling me I can't go to work, but everyone, everyone coming in doesn't have to get one, I go, well, once we found out, when Fauci said, okay, I'm sorry, but if you've had two boosters and two vaccines, you can get and give COVID to another guy who's had five vaccines and four boosters. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between a vaccine and a booster? I don't know, it's just more vaccine, but booster sounds better. Anyway, a guy with 25 vaccines would get and give COVID to another guy with 25 <laughs> vaccines. That's why I'm introducing the daily COVID shot. Every day you get a shot. <laughs> By the time you get to your car, you got no immunity, but it's a beautiful <laughs> 39 seconds. <laughs> we need this right now. We've needed this for the last three years. It's funny. And by the way, like most humor, it's funny because it's rooted in the truth. So why don't we see this on late night television? Why isn't Jimmy Fallon doing this kind of humor or Jimmy Kimmel or Stephen Colbert? Forget that. Why doesn't Saturday Night Live do this? These are Saturday Night Live alums. Saturday Night Live doesn't have this kind of humor. Why? Why? Well, don't ask me. 
I'm Generation X. These are my guys. I mean, I grew up with these guys and and Mike Myers and Dennis Miller and, you know, Phil Harbin when Saturday Night Live was funny. Don't ask me. Ask this guy. It's his fault. Doug Blair, your generation. You brought us this lousy, horrible Saturday Night Live now. Yeah. Why aren't you funny? I don't know. It's it's a great question because I try every day. I tell myself jokes in the mirror and, and nobody laughs. So I, I don't know. Okay, I'm working on you. it. You, you are funny and I laugh at you every time I see you. No, no, no. Why doesn't your generation appreciate and for that matter demand this kind of humor. I, I think that's a really good point because it is sort of the older generation that's coming up and it's more of making the jokes about Fauci and well by the way can we acknowledge really quickly how good Dana Carvey's Fauci is? I think it's like it's perfect. It's so on point. Everything he does is perfect. Right. On, his voices are it, it reaches a point Doug where when people do an impersonation of former President George Herbert Walker Bush they're actually doing an impersonation of Dana Carvey doing right. an impersonation of Bush and if this Fauci thing catches on it'll be the same thing. exactly no i remember when even growing up when i would listen to church lady and just think that that was the funniest thing ever but i think to your to your larger point here is why my generation isn't laughing at this is because comedy for gen z and millennials has become less about laughing and more about clapping and hooting about something that you agree with so you've watched some of these netflix specials with like hannah gadsby who is this australian quote-unquote comedian who literally says things like pablo picasso is a racist is that really funny? No, but you hear the crowd like laughing and screaming and saying this is wonderful and amazing and she should keep doing this. Or you hear yeah. other people on like Saturday Night Live when um, uh, Kate McKinnon goes out and pretends to be Hillary Clinton. It's not oh, right. funny, yeah. but it's, it's going to support your messaging. So of course you're gonna support it. I think Dana Carvey, and to an extent a lot of these older Saturday Night Live people who still actually respect comedy as a concept, they see comedy as making people laugh, which yeah. it is. Thank you. By the way, uh, I've got my own personal aside about Dana Carvey for a moment. He's 68 years old. Looks good. He looks amazing. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> I want to look that good when I'm 68, you know, 30 years from now. Uh, as uh, you, you make a great point about comedy now being all about the, the liberals in the audience whooping and, and cheering because they've got someone on their side. I think it's our friend Stephen Miller from Spectator right. who calls the Stephen Colbert show not a comedy show, but group therapy for right. liberals. That's really what it is. It's just self-affirmation. But isn't there a smart network executive who sees something like this? 50 seconds of brilliance between these two, funnier than anything you're seeing right now. Shouldn't they give these guys a contract right now? They, they would immediately dominate late night television. Well, I think the issue though, is that we've seen that they don't. So for example, there was an instance where Jon Stewart went on Stephen Colbert's show, and this was when COVID was still, you weren't allowed to talk about the lab leak theory, right? That was yeah. verboten. And he says, are we nuts? Like it's, it's literally in the place where this Wuhan Institute that is studying this virus was, right. and everybody's sick. And you can see on Colbert's face, he's like, just turn it off, turn it off, cut him he's off. Like, do something, Co commercial, commercial. Oh, yeah. That's why you You're can't 100%. do it because they, they know that like if that happens, their audience is going to eat them alive, or the studio oh, execs. You and I did the alive. exact same sub, uh, content that Dana Carvey and David Spade just did, but we did it seriously on YouTube. It would be censored. It would Agreed. be deleted. Agreed. Let me tell you something. If any network executive is out there listening and you're tired of the lousy ratings you're getting, you sign Dana Carvey, David Spade, Kevin Nealon, Dennis Miller. Give them an hour a night, and it will be through the roof. But you won't because you don't care about entertainment. That's it for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow, same time, same place. In the meantime, see you on the radio.